in this module, we're going to start talking about our primate taxonomy. And we're going to start with our prosimians or our strepsirrhini. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and pause this presentation, grab your taxonomy chart and grab your book because you will want to reference both of those as we go through the slides. This will help you um, be able to find answers to our taxonomy exam um, that we'll have at the end of this section. So if you um, follow along as I'm doing the presentation with the book and the chart, it'll be much more helpful for you guys as you move through the class and take that exam. You guys should recognize this slide here. It's our order of primate slide and it was what we ended our last module with. Um, and I did say that we would talk about these highlighted red rhinies. So if you see, if you go through the primate order, you'll see that we have our prosimians, which are classified as strepsirrhini, and you should be able to find that on your chart. These include our lorises, our lemurs, and our tarsiers. We have our anthropoids, which are our haplorhinies. Um, so you guys should also see that on your taxonomy chart. And then within our haplorhines, we have two other divisions. We have our platyrhines and our catarhines. Our platyrhines are our New World monkeys, so living in the Americas. And our catarhines are our Old World monkeys living in Africa and Asia. And then our hominoids. So this rhines is going to be really important because it's going to be a quick and easy way for you guys to visually categorize primates. So what does rhiny mean? Rhiny is short for rhinarium, and rhinarium means nose. So if you think of a rhinoceros, a rhinoceros has a very distinct nose, right? They have that horn on their nose. Rhinies are noses. So if you recall the last slide, we had lots of words that ended in rhiny, which means that we're gonna be able to visually look at a primate's nose to be able to tell some important things about it. So let's take a look at these two primates here. So your primate on the left is a little lemur and your primate on the right is a baboon. So our lemur, which is a prosimian, it's the first group we're gonna start with, they have wet noses that are connected to the upper lip. So think about like a dog or a cat, right? Their nose is moist and they have sort of that connection in the middle of that upper lip. Do you see that there? That connects that upper lip towards to the gum. Okay, so their nose is wet and it's connected to the upper lip. Okay, so that limits the amount of facial expression that this primate can do. So this primate's nose, the lemur's nose, is much more similar to our mammal friends than it is to the rest of our primates. Now remember, primate, the primate orders are trends. So our prosimians, are at the beginning of that primate order. So they're still going to have some characteristics that are much more mammalian than the rest of our primates. Now go ahead and look at that baboon. He is a haplorhine. He's got a dry nose, just like you and I, and his upper lip is not connected. So he has a big range of motion um, in facial expressions, just like you and I. So we know that the primate order consists of two major suborders, which we just talked about. Um, those are our prosimians, which is the exact same as a strepsirrhini. So prosimian and strepsirrhini are interchangeable, and our anthropoideae and our haplorhini can be interchangeable. So again, make sure that you guys understand that some of those words are interchangeable. The prosimians were the first of the suborders to evolve. They are often called lower primates, and the word prosimian literally means pre-monkey. So they are our first step to becoming primates. Okay, so strepsirrhini and prosimians are the same. Haplorhini and anthropoids are the same. Those words are interchangeable. Before we jump into individual prosimians, let's just take a look at the differences between prosimians and anthropoids. Okay, our prosimians, our lemurs, our lorises, our tarsiers often have what is referred to as a dental comb. So it's a part of their dentition that helps them with grooming. This is absent in our monkeys, our anthropoids. So post-orbital eye opening. So post-orbital just means behind the eye orbit. Um, there's an opening with our prosimians. In our primates, our haplorhines, the entire eye orbit is enclosed. So you or I have an enclosed eye orbit. 
Prosimians tend to have smaller brains um, in relation to their body size. We call this their encephalization quotient. I know I mentioned encephalization. Encephalization is going to be a term that you hear often, and that's your body to brain size. Whereas our anthropoids, our monkeys, and other primates are going to have a larger brain or brain ratio. Our prosimians do still have at least one claw. So while the trend is for nails, which they will have nails um, on all of their digits except for one. So our prosimians usually do have a grooming claw, whereas our haplorhynes and the rest of our primates have nails on all of their digits. Um, our prosimians, for the most part, are going to be nocturnal. So there are a few diurnal or daytime um, primates, but most of our prosimians are still nocturnal, which is unique because our trend is moving towards being more diurnal, more being day active. So in our anthropoids, there are very, very few nocturnal species. And finally, in our prosimians, we have a more seasonal breeding pattern. So again, think about other animals that you know, other mammals, they breed um, and they, they tend to have their babies in the spring. Where with other primates, um, our haplorhynes, it's less seasonal. So humans do not have breeding seasons. Um, babies can be born any time of year. All right, so let's jump into some general facts about our prosimians before we get into our individual primates. So again, we mentioned the rhinarium. That nose is hugely important for you to be able to determine if an animal is a strepsorhine or a haplorhine. Our strepsorhine, our prosimians, have that moist, naked rhinarium or nose with an attached upper lip. Okay, so that's going to make sure, or that's going to make that upper lip less mobile because it's going to be attached down the center. And they're going to have a greater reliance on olfaction. Now remember, olfaction means sense of smell. You guys should star that term because you're going to see it again later. So just like our other mammal friends, they still do rely heavily on their sense of smell. And that's a trend that we'll see change as we move through the primate order. Facial expression. Again, because of that attached upper lip, they're going to have a less, less range of facial expression than our other primates. That grooming claw that we mentioned, it's usually on the second digit. Um, they have teeth. Their dental formula is a little bit different than our um, haplorhynes because they have that dental comb which are elongated incisors used for grooming. We're not gonna harp on that dental formula, but just know that their dentitions are a little bit different. Again, reproduction is generally seasonal. Activity often, but not always nocturnal. Um, many diurnal primates on Madagascar. Um, nocturnal species have large eyes and they possess a tapeta lucida. So what's a tapeta lucidum? So if you've ever come across a deer while driving at night, their eyes reflect back at you. Um, if you have a cat in your household, you know that when it's dark, um, their eyes are reflective. So our prosimians, our strepsorhines, still have that tapeta lucida, okay? That, that's a reflective film in their eyes, okay? So this is important because our haplorhines do not have that, okay? So even our nocturnal haplorhines do not have that. It's still strictly in our strepsorhine, our prosimian. Again, this is a characteristic that's much more like our mammal friends than our primate friends. So again, this, these prosimians, these pre-primates, sort of bridge that gap. Infant care. Um, our nocturnal species tend to park their infants in nests while they forage, um, and some of our diurnal species will carry them um, with them while they forage. Okay, so in our prosimians, we have our three main groups of prosimians, our lemuriforms, which are our lemurs, our indridae, and our dabinoidae. Uh, our lorisiforms, <laughs> uh, again, this is why I don't ask you to memorize these Latin terms, they can be tongue twisters. Our lorises are nagalagos, and our tarsiers, or our tar tar tarsiforms. Okay, fun fact, good trivia question, and absolutely something that's going to pop up later on an exam. All of our lemur forms, our lemur forms, everybody in our lemur family live on the island of Madagascar. So if anybody asks you where do lemurs live, Madagascar. It is the only place that you will find lemurs, other than a zoo. 
So anybody who's alive and living in their natural habitat is going to be on Madagascar. Okay, so these primates are really, really distinct because many, 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 many thousands and thousands of years ago, um, the island of Madagascar broke off from Africa. So these primates evolved in isolation. So they are pretty unique. There's lots of nocturnal species here um, and 22 or so in general and are mostly arboreal. So these are really interesting primates. Um, if you've been to the Buffalo Zoo, we do have ring-tailed lemurs. We do see lots of ring-tailed lemurs um, on TV shows, and they're the, probably the most recognizable lemur, but there are many lemurs that live on the island of Madagascar. All right, so let's jump into some of the different lemurs. So lemurs are extant or are living lemurs, range in body size from very, very small to what they're considering large, but their large is maybe comparison to a small dog. So like about 20 pounds. Now, if we, and I know you guys aren't responsible for this, but if we look back at the fossil record of lemurs on the island of Madagascar, there were at one time lemurs the size of black bears. Very, very large lemurs. So the lemurs are very diverse. And they're so interesting, again, because they developed in isolation on the island of Madagascar. All right, so let's take a look at our living lemur group. So we have our first category of lemurs, and those are our mouse and dwarf lemurs. So here's something you guys should be aware of if you're following along in the books. So in the, um, the primate book, the hard-covered one, um, that one divides our primates by geographical region. So when I cover all of these primates, I'm going to be doing it in order of evolution. So our prosimians are going to be first. So to find our lemurs, you're going to have to look geographically in sort of the Africa section. So it wouldn't hurt to take a pause and do that. In the coloring book, there's some great information about lemurs. Um, and that starts in section 4-4. Um, in our book, you guys might have a different version. I can tell you my version is really, really old, but we will see the, sort of the prosimian family tree and then several pages on prosimians in the coloring book as well. So if you guys don't have either of those open, it wouldn't hurt to pause right now and just go and go ahead and do that. All right. So again, we're going to start with our mouse and dwarf lemurs. And just like the name implies, they are tiny. These are tiny, tiny lemurs. Um, they are nocturnal, which means they're active at night. They tend to be solitary. So that means that they're going to forage pretty much on their own, but a mother will be with her infants. They typically will park them in a nest while they go and forage. Um, they will give birth to twins, which is a little unusual. And again, they will park them in nests and some of them will hibernate. So seasonally, they may um, store and accumulate fat in their tails and hibernate. So again, these are very, very tiny, tiny lemurs, and they're difficult to study, as you can imagine, being the size of mice, being nocturnal at night, and being solitary. Um, they are, are also arboreal, so you're trying to hunt them through the trees to study them. So we don't know a lot about these lemurs. Next, we have what's called our sportive lemurs, which I think is an interesting name because if you go and look at their special features, um, they're sluggish. So while we call them sportive, they're not very sporty. <laughs> so these are small lemurs, again, active at night, foraging solitary, and again, sluggish or slow. So they are going to eat a lot of leaves in their diets. So in that special feature, you can see that phrase, um, uh, coprophagy, so that's how you pronounce that, coprophagy. Coprophagy is a tool developed by some animals or a method developed by some animals um, to get the most nutrients out of leaves. So leaves are not very nutrient rich. There's not a lot of nutrients in them. It's a lot of fiber. So in order to get the most out of that food, they eat it twice. So coprophagy means that they'll eat their scat or their poop, and that allows them to get more nutrients out of it. 
So coprophagy, coprophagy, and sometimes cecotrophy are both names for eating scat. Now we have our true, quote, true lemurs. Um, they're going to be medium sized. So if you guys have been to the Buffalo Zoo, you may have seen our ring-tailed lemurs there. They're about the size of either a big, big cat or a small dog. Um, again, depending on the lemur that we're looking at, some of them are nocturnal, some of them are diurnal, um, some of them are solitary, some of them are social monogamy, so they live in male-female pairs, some of them are in large male, multi-male, multi-female groups. So in our quote true lemurs, we do see a range of social pattern. Our ring-tailed lemurs um, are our only significantly terrestrial prosimian. What, is, what the heck does that mean? Terrestrial means they spend most of their time on the ground. Um, they live in large social structures that have both males and females, and females are dominant in ring-tailed lemurs. We know a lot about ring-tailed lemurs because they're active during the day, they live in large social groups, and they're on the ground. So guess what? They're pretty easy to study. Finally, in our lemur group, we have our Indri. Um, so we have Indri, Safaka, and Avahi. So our Indri and Safaka. So if you guys, I don't know if you guys are um, of an age where you might remember a TV show on PBS with the Krat brothers called Zaboomafu. Um, if you want to look that up on YouTube, I'm sure you guys can find episodes of Zaboomafu. But that Zabu was our lead character, and he was a Safaka. Um, so they are considered large or medium. Um, so when we talk about small, medium, large, medium is about the size of a big cat or a small dog. Large, even then, isn't very big. It's, they're not going to be <laughs> bear size. Um, they're going to be, our, our Avahi are going to be nocturnal and our Safaka and Indri are going to be diurnal. Um, and again, they're going to have various social structures, everything from solitary monogamous and multi-male, multi-female. And in our large social groups, you're gonna find that females are dominant over males. And actually that's gonna be a trend across the primate order. In most species, our females are dominant. Jump into looking at some of our individual lemurs. Now, I'm just gonna do um, a few lemurs, some select lemurs, but do be aware that in your book, you have multiple species represented. Um, so it's important to know as a tool that your book does represent multiple species. So when you guys have your taxonomy exam, not every single question will be pulled directly from these lectures. You will need to utilize your books to get some of the answers as well. So just make sure that you're following along loosely and that you're aware that I'm not going to speak about every individual um, within any of these groups because there's just too many. What I'm going to do is a general high-level overview of some of our either obvious characters or anybody that has a unique or um, sort of outside of the norm characteristic. Okay, so let's talk about our quote true lemurs and we've got a picture there of a ring-tailed lemur and we use him because he is very much who we think of if we think of lemur. Typically, if you think of lemurs, he's the first picture that comes to mind in your brain. And we do have these guys at the Buffalo Zoo, so you guys can absolutely go and check them out there. Again, medium body size, so think of either a large cat or a small dog. Um, the ring-tailed lemur is going to be the most unique amongst this group, again, because they are diurnal. They are active during the day. They live in very large social groups and they spend most of their time on the ground. Um, obviously, they will pop up into the trees um, as they need to, either to avoid a predator or to get a particularly interesting food, but they're going to spend a lot of their time on the ground. Now, again, in the lemur group, make sure that you are aware that there's a lot of variation. So that's why we're not going to cover every individual, but again, activity periods will range between from nocturnal to diurnal, their social structures will range from solitary to multi-male, multi-female groups. And here we have an example of our sportive lemur. So they're small. Think of, again, a small cat or dog. Um, they're going to be active at night. So look at those large eyes, okay? So this photo they took with a flash 
So you can't see those reflective eyes, but again, remember that our lemurs are still going to retain that tapetalucidum or that reflective eye. They're gonna forage mostly solitarily. So when we talk about a solitary social pattern, we don't mean that they spend 100% of their time alone. It means that they come into very little contact with other individuals. So their areas of foraging may overlap, but they try to stay away from each other. And obviously mothers can't help but have their offspring with them. Again, our sportive lemurs are gonna be sluggish, so that gives us an indication about their diet. It's not very nutrient rich. And the um, coprophagy means they re-eat their food, so they're going to also eat their scab. Here's our little mouse lemur, and absolutely, as you can see, he is very, very small. So how do we know he's a prosimian and not some other kind of um, mammal? We're going to take a look at some of those key indicators. So you can see those eyes have moved forward um, on their face. They've got those opposable thumbs and hallux or big toes. Um, they've reduced those nails, again, or sorry, those claws have become nails. Um, again, so those are all things that we're going to look at. And these little guys are, again, that first step into the evolution of what we know as primate. So again, body size is tiny, they're going to be active at night, they're going to uh, be solitary, and they tend to give birth to twins. The I.I., he's actually one of my favorite little weirdos. Look at how weird this guy is. So um, his Latin name is Dabentoidne, and I never pronounced that correctly, but you guys should be able to find him on your taxonomy chart. They call him the I.I., because the natives in Madagascar, the native residents there, um, don't like him very much. He's a weird looking little nocturnal guy and they think he is a evil spirit of the forest, if you will. Now, obviously not anymore, but traditionally he was pretty frightening, even though he's fairly harmless. So the response when they would see this would be one of shock, of eye eye. So when Western researchers went in and obviously used local field guides, they would have this response when they would see this guy. Um, but you know what? He's totally harmless. He eats insects. He's got a wacky little face, right? So he's solitary. He's nocturnal. A few really, really interesting characteristics about him. He has continuously growing incisors. So if you guys have ever had a rabbit or a guinea pig, um, that chew a lot of fibrous material, you know that their incisors are always growing. So he uses those um, continuously growing incisors to chew holes in wood. So what he's looking for inside that wood is grubs and termites. So he'll use his incisors to chew a hole in there to get those bugs out. Um, you can also see that he's got that really thin, spindly middle finger. So go ahead and take a look at that. It's really weird and spindly. So what he'll do is use that to tap on the wood. He's tapping and he's listening with those big giant bat-like ears for hollows in the wood. So he's looking for hollow spots because a hollow spot is where those bugs that he likes to eat are likely hanging out. So he'll tap, listen for those hollow spots chew a hole in the wood and use that thin little spindly finger to dive into that hole and pull out those grubs or those termites. So he's very, very unique and very, very specialized. And that makes him one of my favorites. And I think that even though he's very ugly, I think that makes him also very cute. And as I mentioned, we do have some others in our lemur group. So you can see there on the left, that's an injury. Right, and the injuries are going to be arboreal, if you can see him up in the tree there. And if you take a look at his very long, long back legs, that means he's going to use those power, the power of those back legs to push off of those branches and jump really, really high. Um, he, and then he's going to you know, leap from branch to branch. So you can see our avahi, or vaihai, avahai, um, sometimes called a woolly lemur. He's also got those really, really long back legs. And again, he's also going to be arboreal. All right, and there's our Safaka or our Zabu, going back to Zabumafu. So they are such interesting characters. So you can see this guy, and that's actually not multiple 
um, Safaka crossing that road. That's a composite photo of what that motion would look like. So they are hoppers. They, when they do come down from the trees, they hop from like sort of on um, like sideways. Um, and they use those big, long, powerful back legs to sort of hop across um, those distances until they can get to that next tree. And those big, long, springy legs can let them jump 30 feet into the air. So again, that is our Safaka. So here's just a recap on those others, if you will, in the lemur group. Um, and this is just a repeat of uh, some of the information we had be before. But again, make sure that you guys are aware that there is going to be variation in body size, activity period, social patterns, and things like that. So from individual species to species, within these injuries, Safaka, again, there's going to be some variation. So that's where your book is going to be handy because, again, we're, what we're going to be doing in this course is looking at, or in this taxonomy section part, is looking at general trends. The second category in our prosimians, or our strepsilrhini, are our loris group. So our lorises, or the individuals in our loris group, if you will, will be distributed across Africa and Asia. Okay, I don't have a ton to say about our lorises, galagos, and pottos. Um, they share a lot of characteristics amongst themselves. Our lorises are going to be found in Asia, okay? So that's what's going to make them a little bit different from the other two. The majority of our lorises are going to be found in Asia. So look at this little guy. He doesn't have a tail like some of our other primates, but he's got those beautiful forward-facing eyes, right? They're very big. They're going to be great for seeing at night. He's going to eat a lot of insects, so he's got those little radar-like ears to help hear that. So our slow loris is just that. He's very slow. Now, what the heck does that mean? He hunts by a method called crypsis. So if you think of maybe like a chameleon, right? Chameleons move through the branches pretty slowly. But when it's time to get an insect, they move really quickly. So this guy will move very slowly through the branches. And when it's time to grab an insect for his dinner, he will use really quick, rapid, precise movements to grab that insect. He also has a few really, really, really cool and unique adaptations. So let's take a look at his hands. So look at that hand that's grasping that branch. So you see on the back side, you do see that thumb, again, which is hugely important. That's one of our trends in primates, that opposable thumb. But how many fingers do you see wrapping around the other side? There's only three. And that is so important. These guys have no index finger. Why the heck would that be? Well, the power grip, so the strongest grip you have when holding on to something like this, like a branch or a pole, would be between your thumb and your middle finger. So these guys spend all of their time grasping branches, right? And they just evolved a reduced index finger because it wasn't needed for this grip. So they actually only have three fingers and a thumb. So they do have like a little stump of an index finger, um, but it's not really used. Um, it's kind of pretty much useless at this point. The other interesting thing that they've evolved is that they spend a lot of time hanging upside down. So they have um, some unique adaptations in the vascular system of their arms and legs that help them to remain upside down but keep that blood flow moving to their limbs. Moving over to Africa, we have our Galago or our Bush Baby. So these little guys, I think they look a lot like sugar gliders, but they um, are part of the primate family. They are prosimians. These are little bush babies. They live in Africa, obviously arboreal, nocturnal. They're going to eat a lot of insects. They're going to solid for um, solid. They're going to forage solitarily. Um, again, we, in our lawyers group, you're going to see a lot of similarities across them and a few interesting um, and unique differences. But again, that's our little bush baby. Not a lot of studies being done on these guys, so not a ton of information, but you guys should be able to find um, a little outline of them in your textbook. And here's our pato. Our pato is very much like a loris, but lives in Africa. 
they do tend to live in monogamous pairs. Um, and again, a lot of other similarities with our other Loris friends, nocturnal, um, they use those big, beautiful eyes to see at night. So this is our little Paco. Finally, in this section, we're going to talk about the Tarsier. The Tarsier is our true outlier. So you guys will see on the next slide that there is some significant debate about whether our Tarsier is a Strepsirrhini or a Haplorhini. They have a lot of characteristics of both. So it's important to remember that he sort of bridges, truly bridges the gap from our Strepsirrhini to our next section, our Haplorhini, or our true primates. So this is a little guy. He, he's probably at just about the size of either a bush baby or um, you know, a marmoset or a tamarind. You can see he's got that detached upper lip. So that puts him more in our Haplorhini. His eyes make him more strepsirhini, right? Because he's got those large globular eyes. Um, look at that nail. He's still got a nail on one of his big toes. Uh, he's just a really, really unique character. So you guys should definitely find him in your book and read up about him. I imagine I'm going to ask some questions about what makes him sort of fit into both categories. So some other really interesting things about our Tarsier is he is our first true VCL. What is a VCL? So VCL is a, um, a mode of movement, of locomotion. He is a vertical clinger and leaper. That's what VCL stands for, vertical clinging and leaping. So if you look at his back legs, they are significantly longer than his front legs. So that means he uses the power of those back legs to push himself off of a branch. So he vertically, he, he moves vertically, see he's up and down. He vertically pushes off one branch and leaps to the next and then clings, vertical clinging and leaping. So this guy is bouncing through the trees pretty quickly. He's truly a difficult guy to study. He's going to eat insects um, and he's going to be nocturnal. Uh, he is called a tarsier because if you look at his back foot, okay, so you can see that's actually his toes and sort of the ball of his foot attached to that branch. The rest of his foot you can see is sort of um, like horizontal there, going back to that ankle joint. He's got this long foot, so think of like a rabbit and their long foot. He, those are tarsal bones. He's got an elongated tarsal bone. He's called the tarsier. So he's named after those elongated tarsal bones. And those are what help him be such such a fantastical leaper. Let's take a look at the classification of our tarsiers. So again, they're going to be part of the primate order. They're going to be prosimi prosimii. They're going to be part of that sort of lemur infraorder, but they have their own infraorder, if you see, tarsiforms. Now in this chart, you can see that we've got tarsiforms in both prosimii and anthropoidea. So depending on who you speak to or which chart you look at, some anthropologists would categorize them very easily into the prosimians. Other would argue that they are our first anthropoid. So they do truly bridge that gap. There has been a lot of debate in the um, community of, t of classification about where they should truly, truly fall. So again, make sure that you guys are taking a look in your book. Find our little tarsiers and look up those differences. What puts them in the strepsirhini category? What puts them in the anthropoid category? So that's the conclusion of our strepsirhini or our prosimians. Definitely make sure you guys are checking the taxonomy chart and the book to make sure that you guys understand where to find all of the information that you might need for the taxonomy exam. So again, these slides and lectures are a general overview. When we go into our taxonomy exam, you will need to use that taxonomy chart and your book to round out all of the answers that you may need to find. So with that being said, I'm going to end this lecture here. Our next lecture will be about our New World Monkeys. So make sure you guys are staying on top of the weekly quizzes in each module and those discussion questions. And as always, if you guys do have a question, you can always email me. 
Um, or if you want to ask it to the group, there is that um, general ask a question section in the discussion.